All right. Good morning. I am Costa Constantinidis, Chair of the Environmental Protection Committee, and today we are hearing Intro 455 that will end the use of diesel school buses in New York City and replace them with clean, all-electric school buses. Diesel-powered vehicles and equipment amount for nearly half of all nitrogen oxides and more than two-thirds of all particulate matter emissions from transportation sources in the United States. Nitrous, uh, nitrogen oxides and PM are the most prevalent chemicals resulting from diesel exhaust. More than 50% of diesel emissions pollution comes from nitrous oxides. Nitrogen oxides combine with vital... Uh, Volatile organic compounds in the air to form ground-level ozone, or smog, in the presence of heat and sunlight. Ozone can cause a variety of respiratory problems, including aggravated asthma, decreases in lung capacity, and increased susceptibility to respiratory illnesses. More school buses in the United States still operate using diesel engines, including those operating in the city of New York. Currently, DOE's Office of Pupil Transportation, who I think is here today, uh, contracts with approximately 65 companies to provide bus service to about 150,000 students. When totaled, this school bus fleet includes about 9,000 vehicles operating 8,500 routes. Spending for pupil transportation comprises 5% of DOE's overall budget, with approximately $1.3 billion allocated <coughs> in fiscal 2019. New York State reimburses the city for approximately 50% of the cost of student transportation. These 9,000 diesel-fueled school buses place an unnecessary health risk to New York City school children. The potential health impacts from this exposure, including increased asthma triggers and impaired lung function, are caused in part from the inhalation of ground-level ozone, among other pollutants, which is a byproduct of nitrogen oxide emissions. Children exposed to even low levels of ozone are a significant risk for respiratory symptoms and for rescue medication use. Air pollution increases airway oxida uh, oxidative stress and decreases small airway function in asthmatic children. Several studies of pollutant exposures to high levels of exposures inside of school buses from fugitive diesel exhaust that travels through cracks in the chassis and finds its way into school bus cabins. School bus commutes allow for higher exposure because children spend much more time commuting than stopped, while the highest concentrations occurring when windows are closed. Children riding in a school bus inhale 7 to 70 times more exhaust than nine riding residents inhale from all school bus emissions in the area. In New York City, some transit sectors have begun to explore or commit to transitioning away from diesel-powered vehicles. According to New York City's Roadmap to 80 by 50 plan, the transportation sector uh, produces about 28 percent of the city's greenhouse gas emissions. In 2015, the ma city mayor of New York, uh, Bill de Blasio, announced New York City Green Fleet, an initiative to create the largest electric vehicle fleet of any New York City, with targets to reduce municipal vehicle emissions by 50 percent by 2025 and 80 percent by 2035. Intro 455 would require that commencing September 1st of 2020, all school buses subject to New York City school bus contracts that do not use a closed crankcase ventilation system shall be electric vehicles. It also would require that all other school buses, after 10 years of use, be replaced by compressed natural gas, hybrid school buses, or all electric. I am happy that D uh, Councilmember Danny Drum is here to speak more on this bill. Uh, for far too long, students have been exposed to air pollution while riding inside of school buses on their way to school. With this legislation, that exposure will hopefully come to an end, allowing children to breathe easier. And I'll say that you know, the end game here is to make sure that all buses are electric by the year 2040, I believe, which at that point my son will be 31, and I'm hoping I'll have a grandchild to take to school, and then that time, all buses will be electric. And I think that's not unreasonable to ask by this legislation. No pressure on my son, on the grandkid. He's only nine right now. <laughs> but, and he can see this video down the line when he gets a little bit older, and I'm sure I have a good laugh. But with that, um, but this is a very serious issue and one that we do have to deal with. And all of our students, there are 80,000 students, 80,000 uh, children in the city of New York with asthma, 4,000 are, are are hospitalized every single year. And 
you know, there are too many students who have to go through a very similar regimen as my son, where they have to take a pill, a vitamin, an allergy medication, something to settle their stomach, they just took all that stuff, and then before they leave for school in the morning, put a mask over their face and take something sold to dyssonide. And that's when they're well. When they're not well, you add uh, oral prednisone, abuterol, ipotropium, uh, antibiotics. These are, and this is not just my son's regimen. These are 80,000, and some of them are worse. My son doesn't have a, an emergency inhaler. So there are other students who have far worse asthma in the city of New York, many of which have to make choices between affording their medication and paying rent because too often asthma rates are higher in, in, in environmental justice communities. So this bill will go a long way in helping to reduce asthma uh, in the city of New York, and I'm proud to work with my colleagues Danny Drum and Rafael Espinal to get this done. So with that, I'll turn it over to the, the sponsor of this legislation, Intro 455, Danny Drum. Thank you very much, Ms. Is this on? Okay. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Uh, we need to leave this planet in better shape than we found it, and the work to do that begins right here in New York City. The planet is warming. Sea levels are rising. Pollution of all types vexes our communities. Environmental health issues are only becoming more severe. There is no time to waste. Whenever we can reduce our carbon footprint, we need to do so post-haste. New York City already recognizes it has to phase out antiquated petroleum-based vehicles in favor of other technologies that we have no emissions and better sustainability that have no emissions and better sustainability when all factors are considered. As part of the New York City Green Fleet program, the city has begun converting the municipal vehicles to electric. School buses must be next, and Intro 455 can provide the blueprint of how we move forward. This is not a far-fetched idea, but rather very much in mainstream conversation about the urgent actions we need to take to save the Earth. The overall environmental impact of converting New York City school buses to cleaner fuels is obvious, as a massive fleet of 9,000 vehicles will no longer be spewing noxious exhaust. It is bad enough on the outside of the bus, but as a former teacher who has been in the share of school buses, the inside is almost unbearable at times, oftentimes making me sick. We should not overlook the other benefits of switching to electric. In addition to air pollution, noise will be reduced, which is an especially big win for residents who live near schools and bus routes. Childhood asthma rates are, an, uh, at, are at an unacceptably high levels throughout the city, and students who have or are prone to respiratory ailments will surely benefit. One key health risk factor for those who spend time in and around buses, namely drivers and depot personnel, will be greatly reduced. Finally, having a green school bus fleet will encourage all drivers on the road to consider how well electric works and encourage them to convert their own vehicles. Thank you, Chair Constantinides, for having this hearing, and I look forward to hearing the testimony of the administration, the industry, and the, and the advocates, and also want to thank uh, Councilmember Rafael Espinal for the work that he's done on this issue and for being a prime co-sponsor on the legislation as well. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Drum. Uh, at this time, Councilmember Espinal also has an opening statement. I also uh, want to thank uh, Councilman Drum for his leadership on this issue in protecting our children, but also protecting our environment and making sure we are, we're doing everything we can to address climate change. Uh, early this year, I was working with the DOE um, to secure $1.25 million in the budget to purchase four uh, uh, electric buses to start piloting them uh, next year. And I believe this pilot will help jumpstart uh, Councilmember Drum's legislation in starting that process of making sure that every bus uh, goes electric by 2040. Uh, New York City's air quality is infamous. Throughout our city, one in 10 adults and one in eight children has asthma because of how much pollution is constantly being pumped into our air. It is the clearest example of environmental injustice, with low-income communities having even higher rates than their wealthier neighbors. Kids that grew up in the South Bronx and East New York have three times, are three times more likely to be hospitalized for asthma-related issues than if they grew up anywhere else. We have an obligation to address this crisis. In order to see a healthier generation of children, we have to start with reducing the emissions they come into contact with most frequently. Whether it's waiting in line to board the bus or riding with the window open in the summer, there's no doubt that pollution is streaming out of the school buses and traveling right into the lungs of our children every single day. 
Uh, by committing to an all-electric powered bus suite by 2040, we are reducing not just the carbon footprint of our city, but the health generations of New Yorkers to come. Uh, and thank you as well, uh, Chairman, for all of the work you do on behalf of our planet. With that, we'll hear our first panel. We have the administration here, and our attorney, Samara Swanston, uh, will swear you in. Can you please raise your right hand? Do you swear or affirm <coughs> to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth today? I do. All right. Uh, please begin. Um, good morning, uh, Chair Consonides and members of the Committee on Environmental Protection. My name is Alexander Robinson, and I'm the Executive Director for People Transportation for the New York City Department of Education, uh, DOE, and the Office of People Transportation. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to be here today and to discuss intro number 455. The DOE's Office of Pupil Transportation, OPT, is responsible for overseeing school transportation for New York City students. Our mission at OPT is always to provide safe and reliable service. OPT service is provided on privately contracted school buses and through a student metro card program in partnership with the MTA. Transportation services for all students, all of our students, spans pre-K through grade 12 throughout the five boroughs of New York City and for our students with disabilities whose uh, IEP, Individual Education Plan, uh, prescribes so, we travel up to 50 miles outside of the city borders into upstate New York, Long Island, New Jersey, and Connecticut. Every school year, in partnership with privately contracted school bus companies, we serve about 150,000 students in 2,700 district schools, charter schools, private schools, using, uh, utilizing a fleet of more than 9,000 vehicles staffed by about 14,000 bus drivers and attendants. Each semester for eligible students, OPT issues also approximately 660,000 metro cards. All of DOE's contracted school bus service carriers have and must continue to comply with all Federal Motor Vehicle Safety Standards, FMVSS, Federal and Local Environmental Protection Agencies, EPA mandates, and any other departmental specifications. While the DOE specifies the type of vehicles vendors must use to provide transportation services, the DOE does not specify the type of fuel that vehicles must use. Removing particulate matter, NOx, in the environment has been a school transportation industry priority, both locally and on the national level, for many years. It's important to note that DOE's vendors do not currently operate any school buses that are commonly known as dirty diesel, a terminology that refers to a year a bus manual was manufactured, and the te <coughs> technology it's equipped with. With each update of federal emission standards, first in 96, 2000, 2007, and 2010, OPT has been proactive in their approach. <clears throat> DOE's contracted diesel-fueled fleet meets all environmental standards because they either were built after year 2007 or, if built before then, are equipped with the latest technology. In order to improve and modernize the fleet and its emissions output, the DOE in its 2013 and 2014 contracts with bus vendors reduced the, vin reduced the vintage age requirement for all alternative vehicles, uh, those smaller than traditional school buses, to five years. But most re relevant to this hearing, thanks to uh, the partnership with the City Council, the DOE is in the process of developing a zero emission school bus pilot with the pending purchase of up to four electric school buses that will be owned and operated by the department itself. <clears throat> zero emission vehicles, or EVs, are still fairly new to the market in the school bus world. Vehicles purchased in New York City must be purchased through the Department of Citywide Administrative Services, DCAS, which does its purchasing for vehicles um, through the state contracting system. To date, there are only a couple types, two types of electric school buses available and approved through the state contracting system, the state's Office of General Services. <clears throat> Thanks to the designating funding from um, Council Member Espinel, uh, the DOE is in the process of purchasing of up to four electric buses, Type A, to be driven through a partnership with an existing vendor. This proof of concept, or POC, will allow the DOE to validate the functionality of electronic school bu electric school buses, identify any distance and or maintenance issues, obtain driver and operator feedback on performance, and ultimately make a recommendation for the specifications on an RFP should the DOE consider a larger scale investment in the future. OPT is working closely with DCAS to coordinate the purchase of these buses, and our target for the initial order, as was mentioned, is the end of February. Once ordered, the buses will be built, and once completed, we hope to have them on the road in the fall of 2019. <clears throat> As previously mentioned, EVs are relatively new to school bus operations, and thus there are many barriers to any school district, uh, any school system that would face, uh, that would face in taking these vehicles to scale. 
First, these vehicles currently are costly. The current equipment and batteries that they are outfitted with to make an EV is approximately four times as expensive as a comparable clean-burning diesel bus. Additionally, the technology has not yet been thoroughly tested. Having said that, any new technology requires testing, and our pilot will do just that. I'd like to now turn to the proposed legislation. Um, intro number 455, promos, uh, proposed by Councilmember Drum, requires all school buses subject to a contract with the city to eventually be EVs. While DOE supports the goal to ensure that school buses meet or ex exceed current air quality standards, the current marketing market availability of EVs would not allow DOE to meet a mandate for wide use of electric buses. In addition, requiring OPT's existing vendors to use EVs even as a portion of their fleets would require a significant investment in infrastructure at each operating facility, especially to support large-scale electric bus operations. We are also concerned that the legislation as written would impose an unfunded mandate. While there are currently many state and federal incentives for EVs through grants and salvage buybacks, these opportunities are unfortunately reserved for government-owned entities. Our contracted bus vendors, therefore, would not qualify for these grant opportunities. As a result, the majority of the associated expenses required to meet an EV mandate will be borne by the DOE through increases in contractors' daily busing, daily busing rates, which they will use to offset uh, their additional capital costs. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify again uh, and today. I share the Council's commitment to improving our environment and look forward to working with the Council to advance our shared goals, starting with the implementation of the electric bus pilot program. And with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Do you have any testimony? No, just questions. Just questions, okay. All right, so how many children under five are on New York City school buses? Um, currently, we transport uh, students for an early intervention and special education pre-K program only, uh, and it's about 16,000. 16,000. How many under 12? I would have to get that number. <laughs> okay, that's fair. That's fair. Um, and you know, I'm just kind of looking at your testimony. How many buses currently have that closed crank ventilation system? So all of, well, so <clears throat> we have buses that are um, newer than 2007, and 2007 and 2010 emission standards were about the same. So they meet all of those standards. So be any of our fleet that's uh, below that year, um, all of our fleet lower than that have the GPFs and or the crankcase, closed crankcase ventilation system. So how many of those buses are not, would not have that crankcase uh, ventilation system? Only those buses that are newer than 2007, 2010. That, so so the buses that are newer than 20, 2007, 2010 would have it, and the ones that would not, would not have, would not because have it. Because their engines already meet, the, if they're diesel buses, it right. would already meet the standards without the additional system. So how many buses are you envisioning would have to be replaced through this legislation by 2020? Well, according to the way it is currently written, if it was 10 years or older, uh, then mm. it, it, I, I suppose it would have to be looking at the way the, test, the, the legislation is written, because as I read it, it says buses that are 10 years or older. So right now, 10 years or older would mean buses that are... Well, by 2020, 20, so it'd be, but, so be so. before 2010. So how many of those are out there? I'll have to, I'll definitely have to get that. Well, that's a pretty important number to know, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that we're trying to uh, reduce emission, not reduce emissions, but reduce a, a lot of pollution that's coming from these buses. How many... Uh, so, so we currently have. Um, and I know that, please don't quote me of the EPA standards because the EPA right now doesn't exist. So, I mean. <laughs> I wasn't going to quote the EPA standards. But, but I was going to tell you that we have, um, that we do have about 8,500 routes, as you mentioned, a little bit more than 9,000 buses. And all of those buses um, do meet the vintage years and also have the latest technology, unless they are new buses, in which case they have the three gram diesel engines that already reduce the NOx in the air without the DPF or the crankcase ventilation. All right. All right, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna turn this over. I know we have both sponsors of the, of the legislation here. I, I have more questions, but I'm gonna yield my time to Councilmember Drum and Councilmember Espinal, and then if they don't ask the questions I'm gonna ask, I'm gonna come back. And I just <laughs> wanted to clarify, the number that you wanted were the number of pre-2007 pre 
school buses. Well, I'm, I'm just trying to get a sense of how many comply with this, you know, closed crankcase ventilation system requirement, right? So, so again, I just want to make sure I'm understanding it correctly. All of our buses comply with all of the standards. The only buses that would need the crankcase ventilation are our buses that are earlier than the ones we already have. And we already, those have already been done. All of our buses have either DPF or the closed crankcase. So, so what you're telling me, so you're telling me if all these buses, uh, excuse me guys, so if you're telling me all these buses comply with the legislation already, that the early, the really date we're talking about is the next 10 years, which is 2030. And which is 12 years from now. So you're telling me by 12 years from now, we can't get to compressed natural gas and to electric is what your, is, is what your testimony is today. Mainly because there's not the infrastructure or the availability of those vehicles now. In 12 years. Well, yeah, I'm not talking about tomorrow. We're talking about in, in 12 Absolutely. years. It would also require... I mean, in, in 12 years, I think there'll be... Probably we'll go through at least one more mayoralty completely if they serve eight years and the rest of this, this term. Uh, so I think that 12 years is a pretty big window. Uh, I'm, I'm not seeing... You know, I, I understand today we don't have the infrastructure... But I don't see how we can testify because we have, don't have the infrastructure in 2018 that by 2030 we can't get there. I'm, I'm mystified that by that. I think we definitely want to make sure <laughs> that we have uh, looked and tested at anything we specify in a contract. But as we move <clears> forward, <throat> these are changes that actually have to go into a contract. Um, right. So we would have to make changes to those contracts. All right. So with that, I'm going I'm to turn it over to Councilmember Drum and then Councilmember Espinal. And oh, before that, I'll, we're, we're, rec we're joined by Councilmembers Levin from Brooklyn and Councilmember Richards from Queens. Councilmember Drum? Sure. So just oh, and Councilmember Yeager as well from Brooklyn. Sorry about that. Yeah. Just to follow up on what you were saying before. So uh, where do you want to go with this pilot then? Where, where do you think this will ends up and um, how are you going to uh, react to or respond to um, the information that you gather from the pilot? Well, I, there's there's a lot to there's a lot to learn. Um, there's a lot to learn about how electric buses operate on our routes, on the routes that we operate in New York City, um, the stop and go, the distance in many cases, the the pilot buses. Um, thanks to um, Councilmember Espinal that we're going to be getting will be Type A buses. Those are special education um, smaller buses um, that are going to be put on the road. We're going to have driver feedback. Supervisor feedback, company feedback. Uh, we're going to look at um, going to look at distance reliability, technical reliability, any anything we have with any sort of um, technical issues at all. Going to take a look at comfort, um, how it works with added devices that are on those buses. So obviously the uh, the number of batteries you have on an electric bus uh, increases the weight, and how that weight increases the amount of distance you can go. We're going to need added batteries for heaters, added batteries for air conditioning, added batteries for wheelchair lifts. So we're going to look at all of that, uh, and then hope to hope to with the purchase of up to up to four of these buses, use that information as I said to uh, help write specifications either for something that we do or that we put into a contract going forward with the with the vendors because as we as we move forward with new contracts if we were to bid we currently do specify the type of bus they have um, meaning it has to be of a certain size we've never specified the type of fuel obviously certain fuels are not allowed but uh, if we were to actually specify something we would want to make sure that those specifications are are on point and and give all the information to the company that's going to be purchasing that and how long is the pilot uh, we hope it to be at least um, nine months but six to nine months in your testimony you say that uh, the current market availability of EVs would not allow the DOE to meet a mandate for uh, wide uses of electric buses. Where does that information come from? Um, first, of, first and foremost, from my knowledge of the industry, um, my work directly with the National Association of Pupil Transportation, National Association of State Directors of Pupil Transportation, and our National School Transportation Association. Um, there are several manufacturers out there, um, several who are here today, who do uh, build these buses. Several of these buses are in test, uh, but they are not currently available, meaning you can't just go to a lot and, and buy an electric bus. It's not something that's available like that. It's built to order. 
uh, the build time is lengthy um, and the cost is higher than a regular bus. And probably also because the DOE, the Department of Education, has never owned and operated school buses before. We've never owned any school bus before. So uh, I think just to just to start that out. Um, but right now that availability is not there. There's only a couple currently available on the state contract. Well, I look forward to hearing what the, um, the bus companies are going to say about that as well. So. Uh, let me just go to some of the health concerns that we have. How likely is it that um, the adverse health impacts anticipated from the use of diesel vehicles will impact children? I'm not a medical expert, so I wouldn't be able to answer that question. But obviously there are some. Uh, as I said earlier, we don't operate dirty diesel. Um, if we see we have inspectors out on the road, we have inspectors that are inspecting all of our bus uh, companies both once announced and unannounced every year. We have our inspectors did over 13,000 inspections on all vehicles last year. If we ever see a bus that's emitting any sort of um, uh, pollutant smoke, uh, has an noxious smell, anything, we take that bus out of service. Well, so almost, I, I, you know, I was a New York City public school teacher for 25 years, mm -hmm. and almost every school bus I've ever been on, uh, you have to leave the windows open when you're in them, even in the middle of winter because of the, the smell of the fumes that come into the bus. So, so have you been on a school bus lately? I've, I'm on a school bus almost every week. Okay. Uh, but, so but you smell in, that? Um, I haven't smelled that, actually. Um, our buses, um, I realize uh, there's a lot of them, and I realize that there's some buses older than others, uh, but I have not smelt fumes any time recently, even with, even with the heat on. If we do smell something, even if it's for a minute when that bus is turning on, we take that bus out of service. Well, that's not been my experience. Certainly my eyes bother me, my stomach bothers me. Uh, anytime I've ever ridden on a school bus or taken kids into the city on uh, trips or whatever, that's always been my experience. So we have some very different experiences, I guess. I mean, it's been nine years since I left the DOE, but uh, still, um, I don't know how much it could have improved. But anyway, any uh, chances of kids getting cancer um, uh, because of uh, the fumes that do come into the buses? I certainly wouldn't be the expert to answer that question. So you've never looked at that aspect of it? I have not studied the impacts of student um, cancer. I certainly haven't been able to take a look at, haven't been the person who would be looking at that. I think that would be something, somebody who uh, works directly with the Department of School Health. Would you say that there's more diesel um, exposure to children who walk to school than children who ride buses? Um, again, I'm not a pedestrian expert. I'm, uh, I hope to, that I'm a little bit of a school bus expert, um, so I, I wouldn't be able to answer that question either. I think these are questions that um, are, are certainly interesting questions and important questions, and I thank you for asking them, but I wouldn't want to give you an answer that I made up. So. Well, there are issues of, of major concern in terms of how being in a school bus would affect the children that we are serving. And, our, and being in a school bus actually is about 172 times safer than any other form of ground transportation. Well, so, maybe in terms so. of uh, crashes, but I wonder about emissions. And you don't have any information on that. So, you know, I, I, and I don't, I have, um, you know, anecdotal evidence from having been on school buses so, many, so often. But um, anyway, we, we, we disagree on that, I guess. Uh, what is the cost of an electric bus versus a natural bus, a natural gas bus versus an all electric, uh, all electric bus? That would depend on the on the size of the bus. Uh, certainly, if we were going to go to bid for buses, I think the prices would be proprietary. But at this point, uh, electric buses uh, are over um, almost three hundred thousand, depending on the size. Uh, and uh, buses that are buses that are smaller, diesel or unleaded, um, are under two th under two hundred thousand. So, are there any um, upfront costs versus long term costs? Um, upfront for the owner, or upfront for the DOE, or both? Uh, well. Um, the upfront cost, I believe, would be the purchase of the bus. Mm -hmm. uh, so, as well as uh, the is purchase. Is there a comparison in terms of what the long term? Uh, cost is compared to those that use diesel? We don't current, we do not currently have a long-term cost for school buses. Um, Keith might be able to answer in terms of some of the city fleet. 
Sure. Hi, Keith Kerman, the chief fleet officer. So in light duty, where electric vehicles are much more established, and, you know, we have 1,700 light duty electric vehicles, the light duty industry is really growing from the bottom up in terms of smaller to larger. Um, you're seeing a cost savings. Over 20 years of hybrids, we get a cost savings. In the early electric vehicles, it's promising. No one knows right now on electric trucking. Electric trucking is a much newer industry. I'm glad there's so much interest in you know, we need suppliers to really develop this industry. But in terms of what it would take, you have over $200,000 increment in buying the vehicle. You have to establish the charging infrastructure, which is an additional cost. And then, you know, we know we'll save on fuel, but maintenance, and this is as much directed to the, the suppliers. So if you want to sell all electric school buses, we need reliable maintenance. And, you know, we've done some electric trucks in the city fleet, and there's been you know, a mixed record, I'm being gentle, about the maintenance reliability. One of the reasons a pilot well, DOT initial... Is, DOT is moving forward with their with their plan. Oh, um, we're moving forward on every plan in the world to an electric, but in the trucking side, we have to kind of prove the prove the case. And so the upfront is the, the cost, the charging, but then we really need to see if the range works for the school routes and what kind of maintenance and reliability we're getting. So it's, it's an extraordinary start. It's the way to start. But there, there is a burden to make sure th that these, these are work and that the technology is there. Uh, how long is an um, alternative uh, energy bus able to remain charged? Anecdotally, um, we've seen it um, by distance rather than rather than hours. Uh, so, and obviously, sometimes we go a short distance, but it takes many hours <laughs> in the city. Uh, but we're but we're looking from what we've heard, um, seventy to uh, seventy five to one hundred miles. And um, how do they perform in adverse weather scenarios? The only, again, anecdotal information that we have um, are from a couple of pilots that have been uh, taking place in Massachusetts and Vermont. Those were, uh, in one case, more of a hybrid electric because they had to add uh, additional um, aftermarket work to add the heater. Uh, but it wasn't, it wasn't necessarily the, the weather. Uh, it was the additional batteries needed for a heater or for um, or for something else on the bus that needed um, uh, needed to be charged. Uh, there is a bus currently being used uh, in Suffolk County um, that has been in and out of the shop, so to speak, in and out of um, uh, repair. And it, I don't think the weather itself has had any adverse effect on it. Uh, I'm going to wrap up with this. Does the city expect any of the Volkswagen settlement monies to flow uh, in for this need? Uh, I I don't I don't know. Um, I know that um, the city, uh, as as government fleets, we would have more uh, more likely chance of getting some sort of uh, Volkswagen or NYSERDA or any kind of sort of settlement money than any of our private contractors would, because we are avail we are able to get that. Okay, thank you. I look forward to yeah. continuing to work on this with You're you. Welcome. So, um, have we been in contact with Twin Rivers, California, on their pilot, and how did that how did that go? Um, so I have. Um, I actually used to live in California, and and uh, familiar with with several of the people who are using buses out there. Okay. Uh, again, uh, a lot of the driving that's done is nonstop freeway driving. Uh, so far, so good. Uh, those, oh, four years. I would say that's so. A pretty so long far, time. so good. It is not. They are not. They are not full fleets. Um, they are being operated on general education routes, meaning stop to school routes. So uh, more similar, more to transit routes than I would say uh, special education routes that are done in the city with stop and go and door to door pickup. Uh, but from what we hear, they've had some maintenance issues. Uh, nothing that can't be repaired. But we're also talking about school districts who own their own fleet, who currently have their own technicians, have their own infrastructure, have their own garages. I don't know. And how about Amherst, Massachusetts? Have we been in contact with them um, about their pilot in 2016? We have. They actually came down here, uh, and okay. we actually went up there to, to see that. Their biggest issue, as I mentioned, uh, had to do with what they had to do to the bus to ensure that the heater was constantly working. And that bus is now not a full EV because they've actually added infrastructure to for the heater itself. Now, how long is a life cycle of a, a bus in general? 
Uh, depends how it's it's run. Uh, the industry standard, or at least my old industry standard from my last life, we kept buses that were larger buses, um, type C and D, uh, 10 years, I think would be optimal, uh, and or, or a couple hundred thousand miles, smaller buses, uh, a little bit less. Uh, on our, as it was mentioned earlier, though, for in our last contract, we did lower the vintage year to to uh, a five-year turnaround because we're hoping that when people are purchasing their buses, they're actually becoming a warranty center and and they're getting a five-year bumper-to-bumper warranty. And after that is when things go. We've I've seen that uh, when we kept buses longer than that 10, 12-year mark, especially if they were going over 250,000 miles, uh, we were starting to replace things like transmissions. And so by 2020, all of these buses would be purchased or they should be not have been on the road any any time before 2010 correct i I don't understand by 2020 there should be the earliest buses on the road should be about 2010 models correct um there's you said they last about 10 years so if they that's the that's an industry guideline we haven't been able to we haven't been able to get that here we have a um 12 and 16 year vintage currently so in order for us as i mentioned earlier if in order for us to change anything in our current contract we would need to rewrite the specifications and redo those contracts so the, the oldest buses we have on the road are 16 years old correct and do we test the emission standards in those bus when we're doing these inspections? Do we check for emissions and for nitrous, uh, nitrogen oxide? Those would not be the DOE's inspections. Our inspections are fit and finish inspections, uh, site inspections, inspections if there's rust or if there's tire flats, uh, DOT inspections and other inspections that the companies have as contract carriers within the state of New York. They have to, in order to maintain their operator license, the de- Department of Transportation comes in and does anything that they would need the under the hood. Our inspectors do not do under the hood. So DOT, is DOT, is it state DOT or city DOT that does those inspections? Uh, we, for their 5,000 mile checks, it's their state, but they're city-based state DOT workers. Are they talking to DOE about what they're finding when it comes to emissions and nitrogen oxides? Are you, are you having that running dialogue between one another? Who's, not who's running point in DOE on these types of issues? So the DOT inspections information that we get is their overall grade uh, of the company. If the company does not have a passing grade from the DO, DOT, then they wouldn't be able to operate with our contracts. But we do not specif- we do not get into the specifications of each part of a DOT inspection. So we don't because we are not the also currently at the DOE, not the maintenance experts, and these are not fleets that mm-hmm. we own. We expect them to maintain a high grade with the DOT, and if they do not, then they can't be contractors with us. But we don't go from place to place to see you. Well, I, I don't think I'm asking you to go place to place. I'm just asking you to look at the reports and maybe have a, a dialogue with well, them. Right? Like you, you can have, you know, right. someone from DOT can give you a report. You don't have to go it's, anywhere. <laughs> we, actually, we don't. Re- we don't receive the DOT reports directly from the DOT. We receive the reports directly from the ca- the contractors. Right. And when I meant place to place, I meant place to place on the report. Right. To compare right. one year to the next. All right. Uh, I know Constance, Constance, yeah, a little tongue tied this morning. I didn't finish my breakfast. Uh, so I will uh, allow uh, Councilmember Richards to, I think you have some questions. And I want to recognize Councilmember Menchaca from Brooklyn, who's also here today. Thank you, Chair, for having this uh, important hearing. And um, just want to confirm that, you know, smog does con- contain a pollutant called ozone. Um, and ozone is bad for your lungs. So when you talk about kids who live perhaps in some of the highest um, uh, numbered areas of asthma, you know, this is a real issue, and I think that's why they are obviously holding a hearing on this. Um, So there is a direct correlation between smog and certainly asthma and other things. So I I think it would be only fair for you to recognize that. We may not know cancer, but I'm pretty sure there, there could be something there too. Um, just a quick question. So just getting back on some of the, um, the, uh, questions around the reporting. Um, so DOT goes out and does an inspection. Do you know the number of companies who've, so how many buses are inspected a year again? So, um, all of the company's buses have to be inspected both by by us. Um, a little over 9,000. Okay. So over 9,000. So we, Mm -hmm. we 
the DOE inspects all of the buses for a fit and finish inspection, not an under the hood inspection, um, once announced and once unannounced, meaning a random inspection every year. And last year we did a little bit over 13,000 inspections for the bus companies, um, 60 plus companies, 72 plus affiliates. And how many and then, uh, of those companies failed inspection? Or uh, buses failed inspection? I'll get you that. I'll get you that number. I'll get you that number. You know that number? Failed. But f I know that. But I, the number, the number that you're asking for is it for thousands? Is, is it hundreds? Or but th the inspection that we do okay. um, can take a bus out of service if a driver is not in uniform, if um, a pre-trip inspection hasn't been done, if there's rust on the stairs, if the registration is not appropriate. But that's, that's not what I'm asking would, for. Right, but that's okay. but that's the type of number that those are the numbers of I would have if a bus is at a school without air conditioning that should have air conditioning, we take that back that bus out of service in my world for OPT DOE, that's considered a failed inspection. If you're talking about fail, we don't have any companies that have failed DOT ratings. All of our companies currently have passing DOT ratings. Okay. Uh, I don't have any companies that are failing okay. any any DOT inspections. And you wouldn't know, so if they inspected, I don't know, 200 buses, you wouldn't get the number of buses that failed inspection. You wouldn't get a report of that from within that company outside of a letter grade, so. We would get it, we would receive, we would receive information that there were three or four buses taken out of service. But one of the things that uh, it's within our contract currently is for all of our companies to have spare buses. So our requirement is that they have buses on the road that meet inspection. So even if they call and say, I had two buses today mm -hmm. that were taken out of service by the DOT, they're telling me then also at the same time, here are the buses that will be operating in their place. All of our companies have to have a 10% spare ratio. Okay. And then uh, lastly, just on the charging station infrastructure, mm -hmm. and I guess this is a larger conversation for the administration mm -hmm. because I know our chair has been working very hard and it's been something I've been interested in is seeing more electric vehicles. Mm -hmm. And I know that we have challenges with capacity around that charging stations. Mm -hmm. So have you started, where would these sort of, Buses would be charged at the particular vendor's yards, I'm assuming? Um, there's or? a couple of different options. Okay. Uh, there are a couple of different options. As we said, we want to, with the pilot money, we want to be able to purchase up to four buses. Okay. Um, we hope that we can Four use buses citywide? Yes. Okay. Um, and up to four buses citywide because the money we received will also help us purchase any other kind of infrastructure, including additional charging station if we were to need it. We also, if there's space, uh, we would use that, use an existing charging station. Um, DCAS has also said that we can use charging stations that exist. We would also expect uh, if it were required that this bus were to stay in a certain area, that, it, that then a charging station would also be put in a vendor's yard. But we're trying to avoid that at this point. We haven't even picked which vendors would be operating okay. this. And how are you prioritizing the areas? Uh, we, ha we haven't yet. Okay. Uh, we have certainly, however, looked at um, which which type of route, not which routes, but what type of route would be best suited for this? Would this be, these are, these are smaller buses. Mm -hmm. uh, these are buses more than likely that will not have um, a wheelchair lift to start, mm -hmm. but they will be operating um, routes that transport students with disabilities. Okay. So I think we'll be looking at length and distance. We'll be looking at the number of students on the bus. Um, if there are students certainly that need more of a, a comfort or quiet ride, because I know, I know noise was mentioned, then um, perhaps that will be one of our uh, things that we look at when we look at the type of the population of the students we transport. Once we figure that out and once we figure out the distance and the range we want to test, um, keeping in mind that we don't always want to test how far it's going to go with students on the bus in case it doesn't go that far. So we have to keep all that in mind. Once that's determined, then we'll determine which of our vendors are operating those routes, and then we'll do an MOU with that vendor. Well, it's my hope, I'll just put my two cents in, um, that the areas you prioritize is the areas with the highest rates of, of asthma, which primarily would be um, communities of color, probably, you know, most likely low-income communities. So I would hope that that's at the forefront of your policy goal here um, as you move forward. But looking at the areas, communities with some of the highest rates of asthma should probably be a policy goal attached to this pilot 
and, sent, and I think it sends a strong message. We're serious about fixing some of the uh, air quality issues, especially in communities that disproportionately are impacted. So, so thank you so much. Welcome. Thank you, Chair. Um, so I guess I'll ask Councilmember Chaka. Do you have any questions? Okay, um, just one more question on the pilot. Are we going to have? Are they going to be wheelchair? Any of them going to be wheelchair accessible? Uh, we're going to look to see what's available on OGS to see if that's an option we can certainly have. Um, I personally would like to have at least one of the pilot buses be wheelchair accessible, uh, but we have to see what's available. Okay, so so we just don't know what the manufacturer has available. That is that we the know challenge? That it's a possibility with the manufacturers that are currently have buses available. Uh, we just have to take a look as of if we, if we, based on how far the money will go, um, if, if there's two of them, one would be wheelchair accessible. If there's three of them, hopefully uh, also just one. We have is, to take a look at, we have to take a look. And, and four is, is what we, yeah, it, four is the goal for buses, correct? We would like to do up to four. Again, the money is, which is very generous, and we, and we, and we thank Espinal, uh, Council Member Espinal and Nick again, but we also know that this money um, is, for, is for everything. So the money has to be for both the purchase of, I'm looking at Keith because DCAS has to help us with this, purchase of the bus as well as any other infrastructure that would be part of this pilot. As so well. is, this, is this something, that a budget item that we have to talk about? in this coming year's budget to add additional funds to help the, the pilot go more smoothly? Is, is, is 1.25 not enough? Do we need more? I mean, I, I don't want to, you know, is this something we have to sort of supplement to help this really get off the ground in the way that, that Councilor Espinal is envisioning? I, I think um, that, that with the money we have, we certainly will be able to do um, a very solid proof of concept with more than two buses. Uh, hopefully three, hopefully four. As we get closer to actual the actual procurement of those buses, um, then then we could certainly find out. But as of now, I think we're going to do whatever we can with that money. And if there's a chance, we can already use existing charging stations, charging stations, and that would be um, less money on the infrastructure side and more money we can put on the bus side. All right, I'm um, I'm looking forward to you know continuing to monitor this. And any questions today that were brought up that you didn't have the answers to, I, I would like to get answers from so please get those answers um, to the committee so I can get them to the various council members who ask questions today absolutely councilmember drum do you have any more questions okay any more questions from any of my colleagues all right so uh, thank you for your testimony I look forward to working with you thank you very much us too So Tevin C.S. Grant, Adriana Espinosa, LCV, uh, Danielle Spiegerfeld from NYU, and uh, Moyan Tham uh, from Jobs to Move America. Adriana, how are you? I guess you're on, you're on the left there on the end, so you can get started. Sure, thank you. Uh, good morning. My name is Adriana Espinosa. I am the director of the New York City program at the New York League of Conservation Voters. Um, I would like to thank Chair Constantinides, Councilmember Drum, um, for holding this hearing today. Um, I'm going to actually skip most of my testimony here, and kind of I wanted to respond first to um, the, the DOE and some of the questions that were raised that uh, weren't answered. First, to say that uh, all diesel is dirty diesel, and although the technology has gotten significantly better over the past several years, um, it it um, it is still a fossil fuel, and it is still dirty and detrimental to our environment and our health. Um, I also wanted to say, uh, to answer your question, that uh, diesel exhaust is um, labeled as a likely carcinogen by the EPA. Um, 
And I know this because um, NYLCB's Education Fund, we did a, a white paper earlier this year called New School Year, Same Dirty Buses, where I looked into the climate impacts of diesel exhaust, the public health impacts, the current market of school bus technology, um, and, and recommended opportunities mm -hmm. for pathways forward in New York State, and recommended a pilot program specifically in New York City. So thank you to Councilmember Espinal for helping to make that happen. Um, I would like to uh, just from the expertise that I developed based off writing this paper, would love to help DOE with actualizing their pilot, um, especially the kind of metri metrics and data to collect from it. Um, proof of concept is, is incredibly important, but we should make sure we're tracking air quality inside the buses, um, incidences of, of asthma attacks, absences, that sort of thing as well. Um, and just to sort of follow up to what Council Member Richard said that uh, these community, the, this pilot should run through environmental justice communities. We should look at um, communities that already ha are urban overburdened with poor air quality, who have higher asthma rates, um, especially because as um, my colleagues at the New York Lawyers for the Public Interest had brought up at a DOE oversight hearing earlier this year, most of these school bus depots are uh, sited in environmental justice communities. So these buses are going in and out of those communities every day. So they should get uh, first pick of uh, these electric school buses. Um, I also wanted to say that there isn't a lot of, um, uh, the DOE was right, there's not a lot of data out there on um, electric school buses, mostly because there are pilots that are happening around the country, but none of them have been around long enough for a bus, uh, an electric school bus to even live out its full useful life, so we don't have you know, a full 10 or 12 years worth of data um, on this. Um, uh, but so right now the single most, the greatest thing that we can do, uh, two greatest things we can do to support electric school buses, um, one is to have pilot programs to be on the cutting edge of a new technology and do exactly what we're doing here, but also um, supporting uh, electric transit buses um, around the country, including here in New York City through the MTA, because the more we can support um, electric transit buses whose um, Ha that does have proof of concept and has a lower price, we can bring down the price of an electric school bus in the process by um, just rapidly adopting those electric bus batteries. Um, so I also wanted to just mention that um, electric school buses, although they do have a, a far greater upfront cost, they have lower maintenance and operations costs. You don't have to worry about transmissions or oil changes, these sort of things like that that you would in normal buses. Um, and that, but so far, though the lower maintenance and operations cost has not been enough to make back the significant um, upfront costs. So again, a transit bus will pay for itself over a few, a few years just with the lower maintenance and operations costs because school buses run a lot less miles per day. Um, that, that return on investment isn't quite there yet. Um, but that's all the more reason why we should be piloting and testing this technology. Um, and then just to get back to, I guess, what I actually came here to say, um, in show 455, NYLCV is strongly in support of that legislation. It's likely to be um, on our environmental scorecard this year. And um, we have a couple of recommendations in my testimony to ha for how to make it stronger. Um, one thing I wanted to mention is that um, currently the language in the bill says, um, requires the use of, um, all electric zero emission school buses, and I would um, urge the committee and the bill sponsor to consider changing that language to zero emission school buses, um, as we don't want to limit ourselves to one technology in a rapidly changing market. Um, although all electric models are the only viable solution today, we don't know where we're going to be in 2040. So I just wanted to um, caution us to not have to go back and change it, you know, sometime again in the future. Um, and. Yes, I'll leave it at that and happy to answer uh, any questions. Oh, wait, I did want to mention one other thing, sorry. Um, so I did some estimates on the climate impacts of converting all of our school, our school buses. It was based off of 2017 numbers, which is like t a little bit over 10,000 buses. I'm told now they're 9,000, so it's going to be a little bit higher than it actually is. Um, but I estimate that there would be a reduction of roughly 18 million pounds of NOx, um, 74,000 pounds of particulate matter, and 2.9 million short tons of greenhouse gases over 15 years, which is the, um, the uh, an average life cycle uh, of a school bus. And that if we converted all of our, our school buses, again, this is a 10,000 number, um, to electric buses, it'd be the equivalent of removing just short of 60, 621,000 passenger vehicles from the road. So this is a significant uh, number, but thank you again. Thank you, thank you for the work that you're doing. Thanks.
Hello, my name is um, Tevin Grant, and um, although I do work for a city agency, I'm here today in, on behalf of Evolve Electric. We've started the electric school bus campaign, and we worked with Adriana and the New York um, lawyers and the public interest and many other groups to bring this issue to the forefront. I talked to Danny Drum last year when I saw that the bill had not gone anywhere, and I said, we're going to make this happen, and I'm glad that this year we actually did get the bill up and we're talking about it. And for school buses to be the largest form of public transportation and for it to be so ignored is, is unbelievable. It's disgraceful that we're putting our kids on these buses. And to hear that they're running clean diesel buses, I mean, that's, that's absurd. It's like clean coal. I mean, the, the reason why you need the closed crankcase ventilation systems is not for air pollution reduction. It is to stop the pollution from getting inside the buses. It is totally different from the D DPF system, which is actually a pollution reduction device. And those devices have been shown to be defective. They, the Cummings just had a 500,000 bus recall, and they are the largest diesel manufacturer in the world. These devices need maintenance. If you go online and look up DPFs, the first thing you'll find is how to get rid of them, how to put holes in them, how to defeat them. This is an ongoing issue to keep the pollution down. I mean, going to biodiesel, going to CNG, these are reductions. But why are we reducing a pollutant when we can get rid of it? The technology is here. It is not fictional. We're not talking about something that we have to make up. Ten years ago, Tesla did not exist. They did not sell a Model S. Now they're the number one selling luxury car, number one selling luxury SUV. The Model 3 didn't exist two years ago. Now they're the top 10 selling passenger car. And it's a $45,000 car and it's, it's making Camrys scared. It's, everybody is looking at them like we missed the boat. New York should not miss the boat on this. We are the number one state for school buses. We have twice as many school buses in New York State as any other state in the nation. Even Texas is lagging behind in the number of school buses on our road. New York City alone would be a top 10 state, just New York City. If you put those school buses together, that's about 50 per square mile for the city. We are choking on the fumes from these buses. We need bold action. Everyone up there has taken bold action because you would not be in your, uh, sitting where you are if you didn't decide what you were going to do and become a city council member. That's not easy. This is not going to be an easy transition. But we need a faster transition. The reports from the IPC and the White House say we have about 10 years before we, we may fall off the cliff. I don't know if it's 10 years. I don't know if it's 10, five, 15 years, 20 years. But we can't wait. We can't play with this. We have to make a faster transition. I think we can do it by 2030. And I'm not just making this up. Shenzhen, China trans, trans, um, transformed their transit fleet in about seven years, and we're talking 16,000 buses. The Bloomberg is reporting that China puts 9,500 buses on the road every couple of weeks. This is, this is America. I mean, we're supposed to be leaders. China is eating our lunch on electrification. They're, they're telling manufacturers from GM, from BMW, that they need to produce electric cars in the next few years or they're not going to be open to the market. Why are we lagging behind? We need bold action. We need forward thinking on this. California is eating our lunch on, on school buses. Um, they will have 100 buses on the road in, by the end of next year, I'm sure. Other states have had pilot programs. Why is New York not a leader? We used to be the leader in environmental issues. Storm King was the first environmental le legislation that came out that um, let people advocate for the environment. New York had the first Superfund legislation. What have we been doing in the last few years? We've been following behind other states. We need to take the reins again and be a leader, especially when it comes to our kids. I mean, I looked at it and it probably cost about $3 billion at about 300000 per bus right now today because the Type A buses and Type B buses are cheaper and the Type C are over 300000 But that's a cost today. That's not going to be the cost in 10 years. But it will be if we do nothing. If we don't push the technology, there's no way it's going to advance. We talk about America is about competition and market um, trends. But if we don't make the market, there is no reason for these manufacturers to build the buses. They're not going to build electric buses to sit on the lot. 
they build the buses already. All they need to do is change the powertrain. It is not a wholly new technology. We have batteries. We've had electric motors for over 100 years. They were electric, electric cars were the leaders in the early days until the um, electric starter was made to, so that uh, um, propane, uh, internal combustion engines could compete. Electric has, tr has transformed the world. We've been using it. We know how to build the motors. The batteries are the number one cost right now, and the battery costs are coming down exponentially. I've heard that Bluebird, in the, just in the testing time, without even selling their bu buses, the battery tech, the cost for the batteries have gone down about 50%. Imagine when there's an actual demand. When, you, when New York says, we want 10,000 electric buses, I don't think any one of them is going to sit down and say, we're not building those buses and lose that market share. There are only like six or seven manufacturers. It's not a lot of people to compete with. They want that market share. They will eat each other alive to sell us the buses. <laughs> I mean, I, it's... That's how the market works. But if we say, oh, we would like electric buses, maybe, but we'll also take your propane, we'll take your diesel, we'll take everything else, it's not going to happen. And if we hit that wall at 2030 and we still have a few buses doing pilots on the road, what are we going to do? There's no way we can react at that point. We need to have the infrastructure in place before we hit the wall, not when we hit the wall, because carbon has a 100-plus year lifespan. So we will still have to deal with, the, we're dealing with emissions from 1920. What are we going to do when we have to deal with all the emissions in, for the next 100 years and we still haven't built the technology to get carbon out of the air? And these are affecting kids more than anyone else. If we can't get up off our butts and protect these kids, what are we doing? You said that it's not, that you were saying that, you know, you don't want to put the pressure on your kids. The pressure is not on your kids, it's on us. We need to make a stand. I think we can do it by 2030. Well, I, I was talking about pressure to, to make sure I have a grandchild. By <laughs> <laughs> Different kind of pressure. But well, I know you want that grandchild, so let's make it a clean environment for that grandchild. Let's do this. We can do it by 2030 if we put our minds to it. New York is a leader, and we should take the lead on this issue. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hi, my name is Danielle Spiegelfeld. I'm the executive director of the Gorini Center on Environmental Land Use and Energy Law at NYU Law, where I also co-teach a course on urban environmental law with Professor Katrina Wyman, who's here today as well. Um, before beginning my remarks, I just would like to acknowledge the excellent work of one of our students, Stephanie Thomas, who unfortunately couldn't be here today because our faculty has given her an exam. Um, <laughs> but her research and insights informed much of what I have to say on the subject. So I think our starting point here is that intro 455 sets an extremely important goal. As everyone has, has noted, diesel buses in any form are bad for the environment, bad for kids. Um, they're bad for local air quality, climate change, and electric buses can help with all these problems. Um, they may even be more cost effective in the long run as battery, battery costs decline, and of course they eliminate fuel expenses. And for all these reasons, we really applaud Councilmember Drom as well as Chairman Constantinidis and everyone else who's co-signed this bill. Um, but I think it's really just a first start, as as Tevin was was mentioning. I think it can be a lot more ambitious. Um, as the bill is currently written right now by our reading, not no buses are required to be replaced with electric buses until 2040. Um, which means diesel buses can be on the roads up and, and after that point, so long as they're not 10 years old. Uh, I think this is way too long, right? My six-month-old son, to put it in perspective, will hopefully be done by college by the time that buses have to start to be replaced by electric. Um, and, you know, we all know, as, as others have said, the IPCC has emphasized how dire the threats of climate change will be by that point, or the effects, I should say, will be by that point. You were asking before about the um, connection between cancer and inhalation of diesel exhaust. And I just wanted to note that per NRDC's findings, as many as 46 children who ride school buses will contract cancer eventually um, during their lifetime as a result of those emissions, which means that between now and 2040, so when the buses begin to have to be replaced by electric, we can expect dozens and dozens of children in New York City to have already contracted the seeds of cancer in their lungs. Um, it shouldn't take this long, 
it's much too long. And, you know, we just heard that Shenzhen in China has already electrified its entire public bus fleet. Just wanted to note, uh, as others have said, we're really lagging behind in this issue, even if we look to domestic precedent. So LA has committed to transitioning all of its buses, municipal buses, to electricity by 2030. It's 11 years from now. Uh, San Francisco has pledged not to purchase any non-electric buses after 2025. Um, and again, notwithstanding all the infrastructure challenges, it's not clear to me why we can't accelerate on that timetable. Just to give a listing of a few other cities that have made commitments along these lines, Barcelona, Milan, Seattle, Seoul, Tokyo, Vancouver, and 15 other cities have signed on to a pledge organized by the C40 organization promising not to buy any non-electric buses for their public bus fleet after 2025, six years from now. Um, you know, New York City shouldn't go allow shouldn't go on allowing our uh, bus companies to provide school buses to our children that are diesel and harming their health for so much longer than all of these other cities are allowing public buses to run on diesel. Kids are the most vulnerable to diesel exposure because of their developing lungs. They certainly demand deserve our attention. Um, I think there are also some compelling reasons from an industrial organization perspective or electricity sector perspective to start with school buses. Because they're not typically run during the middle of the day, they can be used to help balance out demand as vehicle to grid assets. Um, and so they're NB and they have this, you know, dead period where they're lying idle, where they can be charged. So there are certain reasons to think that it should actually be easier from a grid perspective for New York to start electrifying its school buses than it has been for California and all these other cities to, to start electrifying their public buses. And while it's true that there are still questions to be worked out, questions about maintenance, questions about where the optimal location would be to locate all of the charging stations, um, how to capture the benefits of vehicle-to-grid technology working with Con Ed uh, would certainly be helpful towards that, towards that end. These challenges militate in favor of a pilot program, the type that's been announced today, which we think is wonderful. Um, they don't necessarily require 21 years to work out. Again, that's a very, very long time. Um, and the last thing I would just like to say is that while intro 455 does allow or envision buses transitioning to CNG or hybrid technology, although it doesn't require it between now and 2040, which would be an improvement over diesel, I think that there is a real risk to taking this approach. Um, today, there are not a lot of CNG fuel stations in the city, which means that if bus operators were to decide to go this route, they may need to build the fueling stations themselves. And once they've invested in this fueling tech or these, this new infrastructure, let's say in 2025, 2030, 2035. It's hard for me to imagine them being enthusiastic about shifting to electricity soon thereafter. Um, and so I think that the risk is that you get an industry which has just paid a lot of money for one technology and then fights tooth and nail to avoid having to go to the next one. Um, and I think all of us who have some familiarity with politics know that laws can be a, a bit sensitive to those kind of those kind of forces. So my recommendation, the recommendation, of, um, you know, again, not speaking for NYU, but of our center would be that the council would move as expeditiously as possible to set clear market signals that electric is going to be or zero emission is going to be the technology of choice in New York City and avoid any intermediary steps. So thank you very much for the time. Thank you. Next up. Hi, I'm Mo Yane Tom from Jobs to Move America. And as been mentioned earlier, we do need to find models in order to modernize bus fleets. And JMA has had experience working with cities transitioning to electric fleets. And we've discovered additional benefits during this process. Um, children living in transportation deserts will now have access to a new bus fleet when they don't have um, access to city transportation like buses and subways. Um, as been mentioned, uh, lowering the emissions that they're exposed to while waiting or, you know, walking outside. But also sourcing these electric buses in the U.S. can create new manufacturing jobs. Uh, the three major manufacturers uh, that build electric buses, IC Bus, Thomas Built Bus, and Bluebird, all have facilities in the U.S. Also, the city contract 
can also ensure that these jobs target disadvantaged communities, such as women of colors or color, uh, veterans, and also transitioning existing workers through training into these new energy jobs. And JMA actually did help uh, Los Angeles Metro implement a U.S. employment plan into their procurement process for their electric buses. And this USCP approach is a best value approach. And they evaluate the bids based on um, considering the benefits instead of just going with the lowest cost. And so there, are an additional there is an additional ben uh, benefit to focusing on modernizing a fleet going towards zero emission. And that's making sure there's a career pipeline for disadvantaged communities, as well as ensuring job training for incumbent workers and addressing the issue of climate change and transportation access. Um, and as been mentioned, there's uh, only 70,000 public transit buses nationwide, but there are 480,000 school bus fleets, um, or 480,000 buses in the school bus fleets. And so when you have more electric buses, that will help lower the cost of the batteries, and it would also help lower the upfront cost of future electric, um, electric bus fleets for schools and public transit systems. And so the way we see the benefit of transitioning and mo modernizing a bus fleet, there's an opportunity to insert um, a USCP kind of language during this process of modernizing the um, bus fleets. Right, thank you. Now, I definitely appreciate all of your testimonies. Um, definitely would want to hear more about um, how we can make this pilot uh, more, more have more information from that pilot to make sure that we have the information that we need to move forward. So would want to hear more about that and look forward to working with all of you and all of your advocacy work. So I appreciate your time. And please tell Stephanie, uh, your student, that we appreciate all of her great work. And uh, we definitely appreciate you know everything that she's working on. And that we're sorry she had to not miss it for a test. <laughs> all right. All right, so uh, Robert uh, Reichenbach from Bird Bus Sales. Viri Nagrani from Motif Power Systems. Uh, Mark Riccio from uh, Bluebird. <coughs> Eric McCarthy from Proterra Inc and Peter Rego from Lion Electric. All right, go ahead there. Does it matter who in, in which order? I, it, just, then let's, let's get started. All right, <laughs> my name is Mark Riccio. First of all, I'd like to thank the- Make sure you're, make sure you're on. Hey, first, I'd like to thank the committee for having us here and having the hearing this morning. My name is Mark Riccio. I'm the Alternative Fuels Manager for the Bluebird Corporation for New England, all of Canada, and Alaska. And I'm gonna be showing you um, a presentation deck that'll kind of outline who we are, what we do, and talk a little bit about emissions. Uh, just to give you an understanding. We're here to support electric school bus as it stands um, and wholeheartedly support what your efforts are uh, in terms of what you're trying to pass in terms of amendments to the legislation. So as stated, my organization Bluebird is the oldest school bus manufacturer in the United States. Uh, we were founded in 1927. We're 100% dedicated to building school buses for children. We are the number one provider of alternative school bus fleet vehicles uh, for all of North America. And we engineer and test to a very high safety standard. We test to the CMVSS standard, which is the Canadian standard, which is even higher than the U.S. standard. We're also the only OEM manufacturer to offer a complete product line with the Colorado Rack 
and Kentucky pole test as a standard. Um, that's integral for uh, rollover crash safety and also impact safety from uh, crushing the safety uh, cage of the bus as well. We do that standard for all of our vehicles. Uh, as stated, you know, we are the alternative fuel experts. We've been in this for quite some time, since 1992. We have over 16,500 alternative school bus vehicles deployed on the road in over 2,000 districts. Uh, last year, we built north of 11,600 school buses. 40% of that output capacity was dedicated to alternative fuel school buses. Um, we have enough school buses on the road to account for eight times more um, than our alternative uh, buses than all of our competitors combined. In terms of our technology partnerships, we have very strong partnerships with Ford Roush uh, for our propane, CNG, and gasoline portfolio product, and also uh, have a partnership with Cummins and EDI, or Efficient Drivetrains Incorporated, for our new emergent electric school bus vehicle product. We have one of the most extensive dealer networks throughout North America to support all of our technology and all of our units. And joining me today, I have uh, Bird Bus as well as a regional dealer partner that services the greater uh, New York City area and eastern New York. In terms of what we have to offer, we have a Type C and a Type D uh, electric school bus. We received $4.4 million from the U.S. Department of Energy at the tail end of 2016 to develop these products with uh, vehicle-to-grid capabilities, and we currently have deployments in California and in Canada that uh, were instituted at the tail end of September. Obviously, the key benefits with EV school bus are zero emissions. Um, you're going to have faster mitigation and recovery of pollutants in terms of tons per year based on your fleet composition or your fleet size here in New York City. Obviously, future emissions are going to benefit over, be beneficial and accumulate, be cumulative over the life cycle of your vehicles, which is approximately 10 years for the city. Uh, obviously, the vehicle life is going to be extended as fewer parts are going to be on board to, for fatigue and failure. There's, there's just less moving parts and components on an electric vehicle than there is with an ICE or a, tip, a traditional internal combustion engine vehicle. Um, we're going to eliminate fossil fuel dependence while increasing the demand for renewable energy. Um, in terms of what's going on in the world today, I think that's actually a very good thing. So uh, we're all in favor of that. In terms of a positive environmental impact, uh, this, uh, this slide illustrates typical oil change with a gas or a propane bus versus a diesel bus with an EV bus or electric bus you're completely eliminating all of that from an environmental impact standpoint. <clears throat> in terms of maintenance components eliminated, this is just some of the components that are on a typical ICE engine or diesel engine that are no longer needed or required for an EV engine. You just have far less components uh, for far less issues, for far less failure modes or failure points, which is going to uh, improve, obviously, maintenance savings costs as well in the long run. We're 100 percent emissions free. Our number one factor is safety for school children. You know, we have a civic responsibility. That's why I'm here today. That's why my dealer is here today. That's why everybody is here, including the per individuals on the distinguished panel, because we're here to protect one of the most vulnerable segments of our population, which is young children who ride school bus. With our entire product portfolio, everything that we have to offer, we are striving for further and further reduction of pollutants, and EV is the best opportunity currently that we have in our portfolio to completely eliminate the pollutants for North America and New York City. So basically, the average emission rates for 2008, if we were going to have a 10-year moratorium and you were to enact the bill today, we were going to completely eliminate all of these, these pollutants and toxins from the environment if we were to implement EV. Additionally, if you look at the idle emission rates, which are significantly worse, which are attributable to both gasoline and diesel based on the EPA standard, that's going to be completely eliminated as well. It's no, it's no question that New York City has one of the largest fleets in the United States for a municipality. Um, having stated all that, 60% of your fleet constitutes type A or short bus, 40% constitutes your type D or traditional bus, and you are 100% contracted, which drives everything. Um, so basically, this is an extrapolation based on the fact if you were to implement this legislation today and we were going to pull and replace about 50% of your type C unit fleet, which constitutes roughly 40% as a whole of your total fleet, you would reduce over 242 tons of nitrous oxide, two, over two tons of particulate matter, and 
over almost 3,000 tons of carbon monoxide. Yes, that's 3,000 tons, significant numbers. Um, in terms of the charging options for these vehicles, there's a myriad of options available. Right now, right now, we utilize what's called a level two charger. We're advancing into a level three charger, which is a DC fast charger. And we have capabilities in the very near term to, be, to go what's called bi-directional charging or true vehicle to grid, where we're able to harness the battery power uh, from these batteries to feed it back into the grid during peak hours for electricity. Part of our initiative and agreement with the DOE with the $4.4 million grant funds to bring to bear EV school bus to market was also implementing V to G technology, uh, which is going to be coming down the pike fairly soon. Um, as was discussed prior, there are a lot of considerations that have to be made for this. I think it's going to be a question of time and money uh, to get this really going and off, off the ground. Um, you're dealing with a very complex equation with contractors, obviously um, political uh, influencers, um, end users, all kinds of special interests. But at the end of the day, you know, these buses require 100 amps of service per unit. So you can imagine if you have multiple units, you're going to have probably significant infrastructure costs to implement them. Um, so it's going to be interesting <coughs> to see how this kind of matriculates and all develops uh, coming down the line. Um, it was brought to my attention that you may be investigating solar as a closed loop at this point uh, for a solution. That's really not a viable solution at this point. I mean, your average solar panel, which is five by three feet, generates about 230 watts. If you wanted to charge my bus, which is at 160 kilowatt hours, you know, if you wanted to do that in roughly an hour, in terms of the math, you would have to have about 125 of those panels. Based on the fact that you know, New York City is a premium for real estate. I don't see you deploying arrays of solar technology anytime soon unless Donald Trump's going to allow you to do that on Trump Tower on the facade. So uh, I don't see that coming down the pike at all. So um, essentially, you know, total cost of ownership and pollution reduction is the name of the game with this technology. We're offering a product that is 100% emissions free. Our product uses an electric heater, doesn't use fuel oil for the heater itself. So it truly is a a true electric vehicle in the sense that it's 100 percent emissions free you're going to also have zero well i would say reduced maintenance costs in terms of the amounts of parts that are um not not implemented on this unit versus a traditional diesel or com internal combustion engine unit and in terms of service and support we provide some of the best service support and education in the market our dealer channel is bar none and uh, that's essentially it i'm, I'm open for uh, any questions that you uh you may have I think we're going to do the whole panel on one. Oh, question. sorry. Okay. Yep. Mm -hmm. uh, my name is Robert Reichenbach. I'm from Bird Bus Sales. Uh, I am the provide. I'm the provider of the school buses. I'm a dealer uh, distributor. Uh, I work closely with Mark uh, and Bluebird, uh, and we are the largest school bus only distributor of on Long Island. We rep uh, New York City and Westchester. Uh, we distribute all the school buses to New York City's contractors that operate today, along with uh, IC and Thomas. Uh, and I just want to let it be known that we are here. We are in support of the initiative by the council for electric school buses. And we also are take the best, best interests of the New York City contractors as well. Thank you. Next. Hello. Is this on? Okay. My name is Urvi Negrani, and I'm here representing Motive Power Systems. Um, I'm going to diverge a little bit from the testimony in front of you, in large part because it is very clear from your comments earlier today that you are quite familiar with many of our projects. Uh, Motive Power Systems builds an electric powertrain and chassis that is the platform for all electric vehicles. The first ever all electric school bus that was able to pass a California Highway Patrol safety inspection was powered by us for Kings Canyon Unified School District. We currently also are working with other manufacturers such as Collins and in other verticals ranging from delivery trucks all the way to an electric mobile lung clinic. So so if you're in the market for anything from healthcare to delivery, we provide electrification solutions. Our motto as a company is we are here to free fleets from fossil fuels. That is our entire goal. Um, 
When looking at the electrification of school buses, I think this is a very appropriate target because it includes time for a transition. And the reason this is very important is when you are buying a single electric bus, almost every building has enough power on hand to power that one bus. As soon as you are looking at an entire fleet, you're now looking at the need for infrastructure upgrades. And while Con Edison already has programs in place to help with the installation of electricity for green programs, it does take time. There are permits involved and there is a transition period. And so making an end target of we want to go 100% electric is essential to making sure that when you are doing infrastructure planning, you can very easily tell the utility this is the total fleet need and the total infrastructure need so that you can do one construction project instead of every time you buy a bus doing a separate project. Um, as a result, I think that the overall measures end target is incredibly appropriate to include. However, the need for near-term emissions reductions is much more dramatic. And we've heard many testimonies today that cited the IPC report and the fact that we have 12 years to fundamentally cut our emissions in half. So you could add incremental steps along the way to ensure that as buses are being procured, on a rolling basis, you are not further investing in polluting technology, but rather <laughs> investing in the cleanest available that will align with your infrastructure deployment. Uh, in addition, I think that a good example of where to find targets for how to do such a rolling deployment can be found in California's Innovative Clean Transit Rule that was passed last Friday with a unanimous vote by the California Air Resources Board. As has been mentioned today, the EPA has taken a backseat on leadership and presently the strictest emission standards in the country are coming from the California Air Resources Board when looking at the technology side of the vehicle. Now, your vote today um, on this measure will have the ability to push the end target for deployments as opposed to vehicle technology. And I think that both a market signal for the end use as well as the capability of the vehicles themselves must go hand in hand for successful deployment. I thank you today for taking this step in moving towards a cleaner New York. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Eric McCarthy, and I'm with a company called Proterra. And I first just want to thank you for the opportunity to be here. Uh, we enthusiastically support this amendment, which, if passed, uh, will enable school, ch school children to ride a bus that is cleaner, quieter, and safer uh, than what is currently on the road. Proterra is a leading provider of commercial electric vehicle technology. We're probably most known for manufacturing zero emission electric transit buses. In fact, MTA is testing five of our buses here in Brooklyn on two routes. The timing of this uh, meeting is not lost on me, and Ubi just mentioned that uh, CARB's passing of the Innovative Clean Transit Initiative on Friday uh, is monumental in this space, given that it will be a mandate for California transit agencies uh, to use zero emission transit buses by no later than 2040, making 100 percent purchases by 2029. Obviously, this is this will do something similar. In the broader context, the vehicle powertrain technology industry is really undergoing a, a transformational shift away from the legacy internal combustion engine toward battery technology, and we are all caught up in it, right? And there are so many reasons why, and, and we've alluded to some of those benefits already here today. We have, the buses are cleaner, they're quieter, the performance is superior, and there are the total cost of ownership benefits. There are a number of reasons and trends that are accelerating that early adoption, and we're seeing a lot of it on the public transit side. Declining battery costs, again, total cost of ownership benefits, uh, the range is increasing, environmental stewardship, the costs associated uh, with harmful exposure to fossil fuel emissions, and then there are a number of uh, government programs and funding that is really helping. And in New York, we can just look to NYSERDA's truck voucher program. Obviously, we're going to see some of the VW settlement funding, and, and all of this is contributing. Our mission at Proterra is to provide clean, quiet transportation for all, including disadvantaged communities, where a council member earlier today talked about that disproportionate impact that these buses have in those communities, and, and school buses are no exception. So I am here today not only for these reasons, uh, but recently we have started distributing our powertrain technology in this space, in the school bus space. And as many have discussed already, and, and the council members have as well, 
this, this space uh, lends itself perfectly to adopting electric powertrains. And why is that? Well, we've already talked about the emissions uh, and the savings and the elimination of emissions, the harmful emissions where kids are exposed while sitting on those school buses. Council member, you've mentioned several times being on those buses when you were a teacher and breathing in that air and having to roll down the windows. We are looking at predictable circular routes, which enables easier charging and lower infrastructure costs. We are looking at uh, low annual mileage, which, mean, which means batteries can be smaller, bringing down the cost of a total bus. Uh, and we're also looking at uh, using batteries as grid assets, particularly in those summer months uh, where school buses are not traditionally used. So in September, Proterra announced a collaboration with Daimler. Uh, and with that collaboration, we are looking at opportunities to deploy uh, uh, Proterra's electric drivetrain te drive technology with Daimler's commercial vehicle platforms. The first vehicle to adopt that, that powertrain technology is the school bus. Uh, we have co-developed an electric high-performance school bus with Thomas-built buses called the Safety Liner EC2, uh, powered by Proterra, and we uh, unveiled that at a conference uh, in Kansas City in October. So I, th I hope the takeaway uh, for this panel uh, and these council members is that electric vehicle, vehicle technology today provides superior performance and a low-cost alternative to the internal combustion engine. Proterra enthusiastically supports this emerging market. We enthusiastically support this amendment, and we very much look forward to providing sustainable mobility options to New York City. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead. Okay. Good morning. Hello, my name is Peter Rigo. I'm the Chief Commercial Officer for Alliant Electrico USA. Thank you for having me today. I wanted to start off with Councilman Drome asked how the Twin Rivers pilot was going. Can let you know it's going well on the Lion side because um, they just bought six more Type C electric school buses two weeks ago. So it's going very, very well, and they're scheduled to purchase more in 2019 as well. Um, also, the uh, Lion Electrico USA is headquartered out of the greater Philadelphia area, uh, and we have facilities throughout the U.S., and we also employ people in the U.S. Just want to put that out there. Um, we're a fully integrated OEM. We make our own batteries, our own chassis, and our own bodies. And we manufacture fully electric trucks and buses, and currently are the leading original equipment manufacturer of electric school buses in North America, with over 2 million miles proven and driven, and currently have the largest deployment in electric school buses in the United States. We believe that school buses are a vital part of the New York City transportation infrastructure, reducing traffic at peak travel times, and offering the parents of children of New York City the safest form of transportation found anywhere in the world. There are currently 480,000 yellow school buses in operation in the United States. 44,500 operate in the state of New York, over 9,000 of which transport students in the five boroughs of New York City. School buses are, are certainly a great benefit to all New York families who rely on them to bring children into the great learning environments that are provided by the Department of Education. Unfortunately, with that great benefit also comes a negative impact to our health and environment. This fact cannot continue to be overlooked and demands action. Diesel emissions have been proven time and time again by peer-reviewed scientific studies to have vast negative health impacts, possibly increasing cancer rates and contributing immensely to climate change. The wide range of toxins produced by diesel engines are not being emitted at a truck stop or along a major interstate, but they're produced by thousands of school buses in neighborhoods throughout New York City in direct proximity with our most fragile members of society, our children. Studies have shown that diesel exhaust levels inside school buses are four times higher than passenger cars and eight times higher than the average outside air. Asthma is the leading chronic illness and the number one cause of school absences among children and adolescents in the U.S. In New York City alone, over 84,000 children under the age of 12 suffer from asthma. In some environmental justice neighborhoods, the percentage of children living with asthma is significantly higher than both the New York average and the U.S. average. Zero emission fully electric school buses are not experimental. The technology is proven, reliable, and these vehicles are transporting students every day in many parts of the U.S. as locally as White Plains School District in White Plains, New York. They align closely with Mayor de Blasio's New York City Fleet Electrification Goals as Mark Chambers, director of the Mayor's Office of Sustainability, is quoted as saying, electric vehicles are not technologies for tomorrow. They are here now. They are increasingly affordable. 
and they are a crucial, a crucial part of uh, New York's NYC goal to creating the most sustainable big city in the world. While the initial cost may be higher, the year-over-year -year maintenance costs are a fraction of a traditional school bus powered by an internal combustion engine, making the total cost of ownership less for the electric school bus when compared to a diesel-powered bus over the life of the vehicle. As we speak, funding is being secured by cities and states across the nation for fully electric, zero emission buses from sources like 2.7 billion, available as part of the Volkswagen Air Act Civil Settlement, 127 million, of which will be spent towards clean air projects right here in New York. This is in addition to over $200 million that will be available in the state of California for the purchase of electric buses in 2019 alone. Furthermore, the batteries within electric school buses may be able to serve local utility companies as energy storage assets to off-peak demand, uh, uh, further improving the reliability of our energy grid. Lion is currently engaged in a pilot program with Con Edison to help make this a reality. New York City will become a leader in zero emission public transportation options and work diligently to not only protect its citizens from the harmful effects of diesel emissions, but also be a leading force to combat climate change. Intro 455 sets a clear, clear path to accomplish both goals and ensure that we're protecting our most precious assets, our children, our communities, and our planet. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, yeah, so there was a lot of talk about maintenance um, that the DOE talked about. There were some reports in other states that there were some challenges with maintenance, especially when it came to the heaters. Can you talk a little bit about the maintenance and what's you know how much more complicated would it be than traditional? Sure. Uh, the initial pilot was three years ago. So like I said, we've deployed over 200 vehicles since then. Um, there's a lot less things to break in an electric vehicle, and 80% of repairs are done remotely through telematics. So it's, it's a much simpler um, to keep those vehicles on the road. And then what is the overall payback on the vehicles that you, you currently have? Sure. So um, it depends on the mileage, and, and the, um, we could work with the school districts to pick the routes that make most sense for electric. And our current Type C bus has 155 miles. Our current Type A bus has 150 miles. It also has swappable batteries, which is really great and help with any range anxiety out there. All right, uh, I'll, Danny, do you have a... Uh... Uh, thank you, Chair. Not really a question, but kind of an observation. Um, first of all, I never thought I'd be so pro-business as I am at this hearing here today. <laughs> Finally. <laughs> ah, there we go. There's the Republican there. <laughs> um, but I would assume that everybody on the panel would disagree with um, the director's point where she said uh, current market availability of EVs would not allow the DOE to meet uh, a mandate for wider usage of electric buses. Yeah, absolutely. Um, when the orders come in, uh, we can take them. We're taking pre-orders uh, for 2019 all the way out to 2020. People are earmarking their VW funds. Our phones are ringing. We're getting 10 calls a day from people saying, hey, I want electric school buses. What do I need to do to get them? And I'm sure it's the same across right. Right. across yes. all the competitors out there. It's, it's the same for us. We have that uh, fully integrated into our product lineup, and we can build to demand um, to incorporate into our current line. And I, I can just share the public transit perspective, and I appreciate the comments of an earlier speaker that rattled off city after city that is mandating and pledging all electric by a date certain. Nearly 10% of all North American transit sales last year, 10%, were zero emission, all electric. And we're seeing that trend continue. Obviously, we talked about the ICT. Uh, so this, this trend uh, is continuing. There was, there was mention about the VW settlement funds. Uh, there's $54 million apportioned towards city and tra city transit and school buses in New York State, uh, and those funds are set to be released within the next couple months, as long at, along with uh, NYSERDA and CalStart providing uh, truck and voucher truck voucher incentive programs, which would lower the cost of the vehicles as well. And I would say, from Motive's um, perspective, it is also. Um, We've grown every single year we've been in business, and we intend to keep doing so. And the, uh, the pilot program that, you, that you've mentioned, uh, I, I'm fairly involved in it. And, I, and uh, there are currently two vehicles listed on the OGS contract. The other two are pending approval and should be completed within the next two or three months, uh, hopefully before that, hopefully by the end of the year. It's waiting for the state to get through the actual 
uh, sign off on it and that I would assume all the vehicles sh sh should be ready uh, within the next four months to start the pilot program. Okay. Um, just to kind of make one more comment. Um, when Motive released our first all-electric school bus, we were literally the first to ever get certified. Everybody at that point was still saying, can it be done? And a mere four years later, the question is, which out of the manufacturers offering solutions would you like to choose? And so the ability to go from a single offering to a full portfolio of solutions in this market is rapidly changing. And so when we think about what happens in 12 years, I assume that pretty much anything you want will be on the table. Can I also ask uh, the place of manufacture? Are any in New York State? We'll have a facility in Albany, New York, where we can do end manufacturing by the end of the month. Um, one of our bodybuilder partners is in New York, about an hour and a half away from here. Um, that's TransTech Bus. Uh, Bluebird Manufacturers located in Georgia, but as I said, I'm located in Plainview and White Plains. Uh, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, relatively close, very close to New York City, and we provide all the school buses to New York City. Uh, we do do our service warranty repair work for the vehicles, so we have a direct access to New York City. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Chairman Trump. Thank you for your time. All right, so we have Christine Appa from uh, New York uh, Lawyers for the Public Interest, Samantha Wilt, N NRDC, Isabel Silverman, EDF, uh, Beth, uh, Brett uh, Tomlinson, Align. Great, Isabel. Shall I stop? Okay. Good. Uh, hello. Good morning, Council Member Constantinides and um, members of the Environmental Committee. First, I wanted to um, address some of the issues that came up. So, the crankcase ventilation systems have nothing to do with what is coming out of the exhaust pipe at, at the end of the bus. It has to do with emissions leaking from the engine mm -hmm. into the cabin. So somebody testified at the very beginning that the buses that were built before 2006, they're, they're actually pretty dirty because they don't have a filter already built in, that these either have DPFs, deep diesel particulate filters, or closed crankcase ventilation systems. So that's, that's disturbing because that's not enough. That if they only have a closed crankcase ventilation system, these pre-2007 buses, there's still a lot coming out the tailpipe. Especially, like we heard before, even if they have a diesel particulate filter, if they don't maintain it and it actually gets clogged up with the soot particles, then it's not working. Then it's almost like the, what happened with Volkswagen where it by bypassed the filter and that's why all these emissions came out. So very important get rid of these buses that are, were built before 2007. <laughs> so if they don't mi meet the 2007 emission standards, we should not have them on the road anymore, you know, starting as soon as possible. Then also let's think about the idling. A lot of these school buses, they queue up in front of those schools half an hour before school is out and they just sit there and idle. So that's gonna be another problem that we are solving by going to electric buses because that's a lot of pollution that is being built up for the people living in that neighborhood and then of, of course also gets into the cabin. Um, okay, so of course we all know about the health benefits of switching mm -hmm. to, I don't have to repeat that, switching to electric buses. And of course, we all heard about the in-cabin problems. So let's say uh, 
if we now currently have the we currently have the 16 year retirement age for buses, but then we heard one of the manufacturers say that actually after five to ten years, there's already so, such major problems with these buses that they have to change transmissions and all these major things. So ten years seems like a good retirement age for these diesel buses, because we just heard it from uh, from them that after that we have problems. So 16 mm. years is a very excessive retirement age. I agree with the League of Conservation Voters that with the change, you know, to maybe go to 12 years for the non-diesel buses. So those buses that are already cleaner, the alternative fuel buses like CNG, you, right now you have 10 years in the bill. Maybe that's a little uh, too strict given that they are so much cleaner than diesel. Maybe give them 12 years, especially for small businesses. I agree with uh, changing it to zero emission school buses instead of just picking the technology. And then I'm adding something, just listening today to everybody testifying, 2040, maybe that is a little bit too far away. We have, we're in 2018. So when we go to a 10 year retirement age, maybe we could switch a little sooner actually to electric buses, given how well it's working in other cities and that we have the technology now. I looked into electric school buses 10 years ago in, together with the Clinton Foundation, we actually worked on this, and it was not viable. The technology was not viable, the, the batteries were too heavy, they had to be replaced after six years, it was too expensive. But now, a few years later, it has become viable. And we heard that today in the testimony. So think about the 2040 deadline, maybe that could be moved up a little bit. And then, yeah, the, maybe we could put an extension in there, narrowly tailored for financial hardship for school bus companies, and in return, move the data up a little bit. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman, and thank you, Council Member Drum, and <laughs> thank you all for being here. And um, we're really excited you're taking this on with everything else you're taking on. Um, and already see in my amazing colleagues have been doing air quality stuff forever, literally almost, <laughs> and climate. And I know you've heard from everyone that this is a really important thing. Um, and as you know too well, um, for kids' health and everyone's health um, and the climate. And we've all heard also about the IPCC and the National Climate Assessment. And it's only getting worse and it only needs to be sooner. Um, and, you know, for me, it, you know, asthma is like a wholly preventable chronic disease and the stress on the kids and the stress on the families and the missed school is just a terrible disservice to do to our future and our families. So it's great to do this. I agree with Isabel and Danielle and other folks that we could do it sooner if we require it in 2040 and we have 10 years, we won't all be, we won't be all done until 2049 and that's right, too late. Um, and we heard about the White Plains pilot and pilots all over, you know, we've got four buses 20 miles north um, and they're doing vehicle to grid integration with Con Ed and they you know can feed back in the hot summer peaks when the grid's the dirtiest it's a great thing um, it, it's going to take some time and money you know there's a lot of infrastructure to build out but we need to electrify heating and we need to electrify our buildings and we need to electrify yeah. a lot of stuff so <laughs> we should do it together in one fell swoop rather than piecemeal in a way that's going to cause you know utility planning problems and sort of a big mess um, uh, you've already heard about California's historic vote on Friday. You know, they have a 2030 timeline. Um, they have 12,000 transit buses in the whole state of California. We have, you know, 6,000 here in New York City. Um, and the MTA is committed. So, you know, there's amazing things going on. Um, we have to do it for our kids. We should do it for everybody. We should do it soon. Um, and that's it. Thanks so much again for all your work on all the issues. But this is particularly important. Thank you. By the way, I think I forgot to state my name for the record. I'm Isabel Silverman, and I'm with Environmental Defense Fund. Did you I'm say your name? Sorry, Samantha Will from the Natural Resources of Defense okay. Council. Thank you as well. Sorry. Hi, good afternoon, Council Member Constantinidis. Um, thank you to the members of the panel. Thank you for everyone for being here and for all the insightful testimony. My name is Christine Appa, and I'm a senior staff attorney at New York Lawyers for the Public Interest. Our organization is a social justice organization and we're dedicated to protecting and advancing the rights of New Yorkers in need through community empowerment. NOPI is particularly dedicated to protecting children's environmental health. Our goal here is to highlight the many ways in which 
Introduction 455 would support and enhance our work in health justice, disability justice, and environmental justice. These are our three programmatic areas. The issue of healthier and more efficient busing cuts across all three of our programmatic areas, and I'm here to testify in support of this bill. As such, we have committed our resources and networks to pursuing a common goal of better buses for all of New York City school children. NILPI is actively working towards building a campaign to enhance the busing experience for all children in New York City who rely on contractors from the Department of Education to help them to get to and from school. We have learned thus far that the system is widely inefficient and places considerable strain on the students and their families, particularly students with disabilities. Our research has shown that many of these inefficient bus routes meander through environmental justice communities, which add to already high levels of air pollution and exacerbate levels of respiratory health ailments like asthma. School bus depots are heavily concentrated in environmental justice communities. Using some data from um, Google Earth and where private school, um, private bus companies are located, we're able to create the map that you can see on page three of our testimony. That shows the placement of bus depots throughout the city of New York. And if you look, uh, we use a color coding system where green, uh, the dots that are green show anywhere from one to 100 buses through um, blue, orange, and red. As it, as it steps up, it shows the increase in the concentration of buses. Um, if you see the red dots on the map, those are where vehicles um, that have bus depots that house more than 500 vehicles. And if you look across Brooklyn and Queens, there are six of those. And these are also located in areas of East New York, the South Bronx, Red Hook, and Coney Island, and Southeast Queens. These environmental justice communities would benefit greatly from a transition into electric buses. Overall, we stress the importance of shortening the time frame for implementation, and we know that this is possible. As the earlier panel mentioned um, from Botera, uh, the MTA is currently um, transitioning into some of these cleaner buses. And in preparation for that, um, they conducted a pilot study that spanned for four years and went across Europe, Asia, and South America. I believe the city can build on its already present institutional knowledge and, and to expedite the time frame for implementation. As my colleague mentioned, we have to do this across all sectors, and it would be wise if we, and more efficient if we looked at it from more of a global planning perspective and instituted the infrastructure that we need to electrify our bus fleets to make our buildings cleaner and greener. <coughs> Overall, NILPI is dedicated to com and committed to en enhancing the bus experience, which is everything from where the buses um, are parked, what, how the buses run, and, and how they serve the communities that are most in need. Yellow school buses are an iconic part of our school experience, so let's make them a cleaner and greener one for the children and our future generations. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I'm uh, Brett Thomason. I'm a climate organizer with Align, the Alliance for a Greater New York. Um, I'm going to forego the written testimony that I submit, submitted. So much of it has already been said by um, folks that are more knowledgeable and articulate than myself. But I'll just um, say very briefly, you know, I'll, our organization works um, with with unions, community groups, environmental justice partners, environmental advocates uh, at issues in the intersection of the economy, social justice, and, and climate change. And so we really see this um, intro 440, 455 uh, is important in that it's a win-win for all those constituencies that we work with so regularly. Um, we're talking about uh, the most vulnerable among us in terms of being exposed to um, particulates and pollution from these buses, as well as um, workforce issues for the folks that drive them and, and ride on them in the Department of Education and the school system, and um, essentially an emerging um, industry in the manufacture and, and buying and selling of these buses. And so um, we really think it's important to send a strong signal um, of where the market is going um, and to convert this bus fleet as rapidly as possible. I think um, I would echo what my colleagues have said that um, I think we may find in the long run that 2040 is too slow of a timeline. Um, uh, there's probably conservative estimates we could find that, that we won't even be buying um, any other kind of bus at, at that point. 
So um, I just want to wrap up by saying that um, we're supportive of this. We think it's time for New York to be a leader um, and that there's you know, no more important and significant industry that, that we could affect. Them. So thank you. I really thank you all for all of your testimonies and advocacy. It's so important the work that you all do to help us uh, craft good policy. So I appreciate all of your time and efforts. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Aditi Vishnaya, uh, We Act, Dan Welch from CalStart Inc., Emily Wire from Greencots, and Catherine Skopik. There you are. And this is our last panel. So if you ever thought you wanted to testify in front of a New York City uh, committee on environmental protection, now is your moment. Uh, because there will not be another opportunity in the year 2018 after this panel. <laughs> Hello. Um, is this on? Hi, my name is Emily Weir. I'm with Green Lots. We're an electric vehicle charging company. I didn't submit written testimony, but just had a few quick remarks to share. Um, so thank you very much for this opportunity. I'll, I'll keep it pretty short and pretty brief. Um, you know, would like to echo uh, a lot of sentiments that have been said about kind of timeline for this um, for this proposal, and that you know we feel like it could be a lot more or it could be more ambitious. Um, based on where we see technology heading, as well as the overall cost savings that can be realized through uh, implementation of an all-electric school bus fleet. And part of those cost savings really come into play through the type of services that, that we provide, as well as the other OEMs in the room, um, to help schedule charging of buses to be at off-peak times, to help manage uh, the batteries of electric vehicles to be dispatched onto the grid um, and serve as backup power. These are all really important ways in which we're adding into our grid resilience, um, which is going to be something very important going forward, thinking about how we are resilient to, to, to to climate change impacts um, and having dispatchable power at our disposal, um, and and so these cost savings can be realized by by school dis by the school district. Um, furthermore, uh, I, I'd also like to talk about how uh, this can be a really transformative aspect for for the um, for electric electrification in general. Electric school buses are relatively simple vehicles, simple to electrify. They're you know as we've talked, they're on fixed routes, go back to depots at night, um, and can serve really to bring down the costs and then bring the um, real benefits from long haul trucking and other sources of, um, of pollution uh, and, and bring those to electric. So um, thank you very much for the time today and um, really appreciate you guys taking this, um, the council taking this step forward. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Chair Constantinidis and uh, the Committee on Envi Environmental Protection. Uh, my name is Dan Welch. I'm here with CalStart, a national nonprofit transportation organization. Uh, I will stick to my prepared remarks. I don't um and on, utterly waste your time. Uh, so CalStart, very quickly, uh, has offices in California, Colorado, Michigan, and Brooklyn, where I'm based. Uh, we're dedicated to the growth of clean transportation technologies that will clean the air, secure the nation's transportation energy future, uh, create high quality economic opportunities, and reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, we, are, we have nearly 200 member companies, including large automakers such as Ford, General Motors, Audi, and Daimler, uh, some of the, the transportation companies you've heard from today, as well as prominent fleets such as UPS and FedEx and major electric utilities. Uh, our Northeast Regional Office in Brooklyn also counts New York City's Departments of Transportation, Citywide Administrative Services, Sanitation, and its Economic Development Corporation among our closest partners and allies. One unique thing we do here that's been mentioned earlier is that we work closely with state agencies, such as the New York State Energy Research and Development Authority, or NYSERDA, uh, to develop and administer medium and heavy-duty clean vehicle incentives for all electric, hybrid, and compressed natural gra gas trucks and vehicle, uh, buses. Through the New York uh, Truck Voucher Incentive Program, NYSERDA has worked with CalStart to fund nearly 600 clean trucks and buses since 2013, including 65 all-electric uh, vehicles. These all-electric all vehicle projects include medium-duty delivery vans, heavy-duty yard tractors for ports, and especially of late, transit and school buses. This summer, the program facilitated the Port Authority's introduction of six all-electric Proterra buses for use between terminals at JFK. And more directly related to today's conversation, 
uh, early this year, we partnered with uh, National Express and White Plains, which allowed the White Plains School District to, de to deploy five all-electric Lion buses uh, this summer through its dealer, First Priority Global. So electric vehicles in the medium heavy-duty space can be uh, versatile. Uh, the latest example illustrates the, that the electric school bus is a rapidly maturing technology. Uh, today, there are hundreds of electric school buses serving communities in North America. Uh, these numbers continue to rise as the industry advances and school districts determine the business case and the environmental and public health benefits associated with deploying the Z Z uh, zero emission buses. As recent deployments in White Plains and elsewhere, including in, in Minnesota, uh, will showcase electric buses can, com can operate comfortably in cold weather climate. Uh, here in New York City, the MTA is currently operating 10 all-electric transit buses year-round. Uh, so several bus manufacturers, and you've heard from so I won't go over it, uh, do have uh, currently existing technology. Uh, some of them are, uh, uh, are purpose-built and some of them are uh, retrofit, so uh, there's a range of uh, available options. Um, the electric power uh, driving range of these vehicles typically starts at 70 miles and can seat 100 miles. Uh, so that comfortably meets a typical New York City school bus duty cycle. In some cases, bus models have also been redesigned to accommodate New York City's street code restrictions relative to school bus width, which removes a significant potential barrier to there being a viable technology for the city's uh, schools and streets. Um, because of, uh, uh, sorry, because many of these companies have uh, local and regional sales and manufacturing operations, uh, such as you've heard from today, uh, investing in electric school buses would help grow local operations develop a regional clean vehicle economy. Charging station installations and the creation of new maintenance facilities would also create economic opportunities within New York's uh, city. So you've heard plenty about the, the uh, impact uh, of making the, uh, the uh, reducing uh, pollutants. One thing I'd like to clarify from uh, the NRDC study that's been uh, quoted is that, uh, that children can be 46 times more likely to develop cancer based off of uh, pollutants and exposure to uh, diesel pollutants. Uh, but the negative public health impacts of motor vehicles aren't just limited to the children. Residents in the communities that are situated near major roadways suffer disproportionately from asthma and other lung and heart diseases. The impact of reduced school bus tailpipe emissions would extend to public health and improved air quality in the communities that they serve. Uh, electric school buses' positive health impacts also reduce burdens on the workforce, reducing time and productivity lost due to sickness, and con contributing to a healthier population and, uh, and economy. In a noisy city such as New York, uh, adding silent electric drive technologies to the New York streets creates a societal benefit. Seattle, Seattle's King County Transit estimated that reduced noise pollution associated with electric buses reduces the estimated social, social cost of noise by at least 30%. And they used this factor in a cost-benefit decision that led to them adopting only electric transit buses within the next decade. And then lastly, uh, since we're talking about greenhouse gas emissions as well, uh, electric vehicles are a centerpiece of the city's greenhouse gas emissions reduction goals. All electric bus technology improves on a major source of in inefficient energy use in conventional buses by replacing internal combustion engines. Uh, electric bus adoptions completely eliminate petroleum use relative to diesel-powered buses and accordingly have the capacity for deep greenhouse gas emissions reductions. Uh, according to Argonne National Laboratory's fleet emissions calculator, the average electric bus uh, emits fewer than 40% of the GHGs per mile as compared to a new diesel-powered school bus. The lifetime emissions of these school buses would reasonably be expected to improve as time progresses as vehicles charging the New York City region would be tied to an electric grid with the GHG portfolio that the city is committed to improving, with a goal of 80% reduction from 2005 levels by 2050. Investing in electric school buses now brings immediate uh, climate div dividends with the very likely outcome of improved performance in the near and long-term future. So to summarize, in electric school bus adoption, New York City has an opportunity to prioritize <coughs> a market-ready technology that improves living standards and the health of children in their communities. Transition to electric drive also creates a healthier and safer future for those children by reducing carbon and local air pollution. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Adi Varshne, and I am a community organizer with We Act for Environmental Justice. We Act is a community-based organization that's been making a difference in improving the health of residents of Northern Manhattan for 30 years, and We Act strongly supports Intro 455. 
Um, a while back, our dirty diesel campaign led to the implementation of stringent new bus pollution standards. The MTA switched from diesel fuel to hybrid electrics that reduced tailpipe emissions by 95 percent. School bus emissions pose an even more serious threat because this toxic exhaust actually accumulates inside the buses where kids are sitting. Diesel emissions, as we've discussed, are a known public health hazard linked to respiratory problems, cardiovascular illness, and cancer. And they're especially detrimental to the developing lungs of the two million New York City children who are subject to the direct prolonged exposure to diesel exhaust as they ride to and from school each day. In some low-income areas of the city, like Harlem, um, the childhood asthma rate is one in four compared to one in 11 nationwide. Asthma is a major cause of school absenteeism, and this can compound social inequalities in education and even lower a child's likelihood of high school graduation. A child with severe asthma might miss up to 30 days of school in a year. We can't let the way kids are getting to school be one of the reasons why they can't go. That makes no sense. Um, I live in Washington Heights, and a lot of the kids in my building do have asthma, and I've seen the way this puts financial stress on families, my neighbors. Um, when a kid misses school because of asthma symptoms, parents are often forced to stay home from work and lose out on a day's wages. Um, New York families pay over $1,000 a year on asthma-related medical costs per child. Um, in East Harlem, where children are hospitalized for asthma at a rate three times the citywide average, medium household, household income is just $35,000, so significantly lower than the city average. The cost burden of asthma is especially onerous for low-income communities of color like ours uptown, which suffer disproportionately from the impacts of air pollution. Um, this is also a labor issue. School bus drivers spend more time on the buses than anyone else and are directly exposed to harmful pollutants in the workplace, and everyone deserves a safe and healthy work environment. We cannot allow bus, um, bus diesel emissions to continue to exacerbate climate change, endanger public health, hinder our children's educations, and place undue financial strain on New York families. We have the technology and the responsibility to address this. School bus electrification will have real benefits to New Yorkers uptown and beyond for generations to come. We thank the council for its time and urge um, the council to vote in favor of healthy, resilient neighborhoods and to pass this bill. Thank you. Good afternoon and thank you. My name is Catherine Skopik and I'm speaking as a uh, citizen parent and I'm also the vice chair of New York City Group Sierra Club and a delegate for the state Sierra Club as well. Um, and I support this bill for two main reasons. One, it protects the health of our children, as almost everyone up here has said this today. And two, it protects the health of our atmosphere by reducing carbon and greenhouse gas emissions, as everyone has also remarked. Children, being smaller with smaller lungs, need to breathe more frequently, so are more greatly negatively impacted by pollutants in the air than our adults. According to the Regional School Bus Study of 2012, a comparison of alternative fuels for school transportation fleets, that's SCRCOG.org, numerous pollutants can leak into passage cabins of buses, amassing in concentrations that are much higher than outdoor air and therefore more dangerous to children and to bus drivers. Uh, outdoor air around diesel buses is harmful as well. Children and youth need our protection for their viable future. Two, we have all witnessed the results of global warming. Every four years, we've had the UN reports of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, or IPCC, the most recent released in October, and we just had the release of the fourth National Climate Assessment, both filled with the most dire scientific findings yet, calling for our quick an urgent response if we are to prevent the worst of these predictions. World leaders have been meeting in Poland for the UN Global Climate Conference working to do just this, specifically working out rules and procedures to measure each country's emissions so that we can be accountable and accurately, fairly measure the CO2 and greenhouse gas emissions in order to more easily, quickly reach our reduction goals. Uh, for example, they were supposed to end on Friday, but because there were so many rules and regulations that still had to be worked out, they continued to Sunday. And uh, if I can just take a moment to give you a quick example. Uh, let's say country A 
has a gas-powered utility. Country B purchases their electricity from country A. Now, country A shuts down the coal-fired plant and adopts renewable uh, solar and wind so that they are now 100% renewable. Country B still purchases their electricity from country A. Who gets the reduction to their credit? Does country A get the credit for their emissions reductions, or does country B get the credit for the reductions in their emissions? So this is a type of very difficult uh, problem that has been worked out, uh, has, being, has been worked out in uh, Poland for the UN Climate Conference. So this particular bill, uh, as simple as it may seem, of moving to electric vehicle buses for our school children does both. It protects our children and it also helps us reduce for our credit, for United States credit, for uh, reducing the global uh, greenhouse emissions and carbon. Um, so as we know, I'll just go quickly here, there are three types of electric vehicles, all electric, two hybrid, three plug-in electric hybrid. And the first type, all electric, is considered by the EPA to be zero emissions. And I also agree with the comment that was made earlier that we change the term to zero emissions rather than uh, all electric. Um, okay. All three types can cost two times more than a diesel bus or more, but costs can be recouped by fuel savings, tax credits, and other governmental funding programs, as well as reduction in maintenance costs. The New York City Council is to be applauded for having introduced this bill, as are all those council members who have signed and those who will sign. My only recommendations are that the date for the transition to all electric school buses be moved up sooner, as almost everyone has said today. And also, and then after we accomplish this, that we do the same for the public transit systems. And I think that's partly in process, as I've learned today. And also an interesting idea might be to have all private buses that operate in the city be electric vehicles as well. Thank you very much. Oh, and uh, one, one other thing that I wanted to add, uh, with all the costs, the increased costs uh, of this transition, uh, we've all heard about, but how does one put a price on a child's health, free from asthma or worse? I agree with you on that, Catherine. So thank you. Thank you, Costa, Samantha, and everyone, uh, Samara, and everyone who signed this bill. Thank you so much. And if there's anything I can do as a citizen, as a parent, and as vice chair of Sierra Club New York City Group, please let us know because we are in full support of this effort. Thank you so much. Thank you all for your advocacy and all the great work that you do. Um, so I want to make sure I thank uh, my staff attorney, uh, Samara Swanston, who's been uh, amazing for the entirety of 2018, always doing a great job. So thank you, as well as our policy analyst, Nadia Johnson. Thank you both for doing such a wonderful job. Uh, my colleagues on the committee, Kamen Yeager, who stayed for the whole committee, thank you very much, sir. <laughs> well, no comment. <laughs> Uh, and of course, my counsel, uh, Nick Wazowski, as well, and to the uh, sergeants and arms staff for helping to make this work so well all the time. And thank you to all the advocates and everyone who testified today. Oh, John Seltzer as well. Sorry about that, John. Uh, see, Kamala was in the way. So, of course, our policy analyst uh, for the finance side, Jonathan Seltzer, thank you uh, throughout the year. I uh, appreciate all the testimony today. And with that, I wish you all a uh, happy holidays to those who are celebrating and a happy 2019. And I'll gavel this committee hearing of the Environmental Protection Committee. Ah, Environmental Protection Committee closed.